Everybody, Craig Deleuze here. I'm still live at SHOT Show 2019, talking to all sorts of cool folks. So please make it a point, like and share this video so that your friends can see what's going on uh, here at SHOT. Now, with me now, I have a gentleman named Mr. Alec Scarlatos. Now, you guys might, uh, you guys might recognize him, and I'll, I'll let him tell you why you might recognize him. Uh, I was one of the three Americans on the 1517 train to Paris when the terrorist attack happened and me and my friends and a few others uh, were able to stop it in 2015. Wow. That's, so, I mean, when we talk about, you know, the, the we always talk about, regardless of the, the Second Amendment is the enumeration and the constitution of a more fundamental human right, and that is the right to self-defense. And... Uh, you literally you had an opportunity to to exercise that fundamental human right not just to protect yourselves but to but to protect others who were there yeah i mean i mean we were just doing what we had to do to survive i mean it wasn't we didn't really think too much on the philosophy of it or anything like that at the time but mm -hmm. um i mean we just had the opportunity to do something so we took it and frankly we got lucky but we had a lot of skills and knowledge that definitely helped out along the way so, in, in that context, uh, how important do you believe that the, sec the, the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, uh, is uh, for us here in the United States? How important do you believe that is to have that right? Oh, it's incredibly important. I mean, um, this might take me a little while to explain, but no. first of all, I mean, we were, when, the, when the terrorist attack happened, we were in the middle of a gun-free continent. Right. And this guy still got a fully automatic AK-47 and a handgun. I carried every day when I was at home, but I couldn't because I was in Europe, of course, and we almost died because of it. If I had a, my gun on me, it would have been too easy of a shot. I mean, he was only 15, 20 feet away, could have just turned around, ended it right there. But instead, we had to risk our lives and the lives of everybody else just to try to survive. And then on top of that, once we got to him and we got the weapons, I only knew how to use an AK-47 because I owned one. We never trained on them in the military or anything mm. like that. Right. I only knew how to use it because I owned one. He had a Browning High Power copy. I only knew how to use that because I owned a 1911. They're almost identical. So <laughs> all that stuff came into play. And if I, I mean, if it wasn't for the Second Amendment in America, we wouldn't have been able to help people in France as easily. And on uh, top once again, America's bailing out the French. <laughs> <laughs> well, and on top of that, um, six weeks after the terrorist attack, mm -hmm. there was a shooting at my college and nine people got killed. And while it's legal for people to conceal carry on campuses, the school can make rules against it. And so right. because they would expel you if you concealed carry, most people either assumed it was illegal or just didn't carry at all. Right. And again, as a result, nine people got killed because if somebody had a gun in that classroom, they could have stopped it very easily. Mm -hmm. And then six days after the shooting at my college, my friend from the terrorist attack, Spencer Stone, went out to a bar in Sacramento and uh, basically got in a fight and got stabbed in the heart, lung, and liver and almost died. They called it a homicide. But the interesting thing about that was before he went out, he was inviting my little brother and my little brother said, no, I'm not gonna go, but if you wanna go, you should take my Glock. And he said, no, I'm not gonna do that. It's illegal to conceal carry in California. And as a result, he almost died. And again, that just goes to prove that you can ban guns. People will still use knives. And even if he had a knife in a five-on-one fight, that wouldn't have helped him. The only thing that would have helped him would have been a gun. And he didn't have one and almost paid with his life again as a result. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's... The, the ultimate thing is getting people to understand, and I think you, you made the point so eloquently, that bad guys are going to have weapons. Absolutely. They're going to have firearms. And they're going to have knives. They're going to, If they want to do harm to you, they are going to be able to get what it is that they desire in order to be able to do it. And a, a firearm with, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, but you don't need a firearm. But, you know, the, the, the thing about a firearm in particular is it's the great equalizer. It is. Absolutely. It is my, you know, my wife, I will not say her weight because it's not polite to say a woman's weight, but my wife is, is small and petite. But guess what? In, in my hands, in her, ha in her hands, my Glock makes us equal. If she's dealing with a situation or something's going on, she's now equal and able to defend herself as I would be able to defend myself. I'll tell you what, too, it's kind of 
I guess, more in the realms of theoretical here in America, but I would much rather get in a gunfight with somebody else with a gun, even if it's fully automatic and illegal. I would much rather do that than be in Europe and try to stop somebody with my fists when they're driving a truck or they have a bomb. So, right. I mean, or, or pick your battles. Or in your <laughs> case, they actually had a gun. Yeah, and we had nothing, of course. So Wow. So what are some of the things that you've been doing uh, uh, since that experience? I understand, uh, well, obviously, there were, you guys made a movie. Yeah, we wrote a book, uh, made a movie. Um, we are actually filming on the two-year anniversary. And um, since then, we've done a little bit of speaking and things like that. But actually, one of the reasons I'm here at SHOT Show is I'm trying to look at getting a job in the industry and kind of okay. moving on with my life and mm -hmm. getting a regular job now. I've had a lot of fun <laughs> the last couple of years. But um, I don't know. It's something about the firearms industry and hunting and all that just is something that I actually enjoy. So if I can get a job doing something I enjoy, mm -hmm. hopefully right. it'd be a lot more fun. <laughs> I will tell you, I've, uh, you know, I, from my experience, I mean, I, I love doing this stuff. Uh, if you have a job, if you have an occupation that is something that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. That's the so, goal. That's the not goal. to say that there won't be challenges, <laughs> but, uh, but it's definitely an opportunity. And you know, I, I think the thing about this community is there's very few communities you have where you have people who love this country who have an attitude where they really just their whole goal is they want to be able to protect themselves their community and their nation i mean yeah i think that's really one of the things that's that makes uh the you know the, the firearms or the gun community so uh so attractive to be in because once again you uh, free, freedom loving Americans. I can't think of a better way well, to put this it. This is my first shot show, and everybody I've run into has been incredibly friendly, incredibly mm -hmm. helpful. I mean, everybody's just trying to introduce you to everybody, and it's just, it's a great community to be in, honestly. I mean, I'm sure if you get like minded people from any group together, they'd probably all get along, but just how friendly and personable everybody is here right. is definitely a really great experience, especially for it being my first shot show. Oh, it is. Let me let me let me tell you. Have you have you been overwhelmed by how big it is? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Trying to f find you here, man. It took me like thirty minutes. We ended up on the wrong side and had had Phil come find us. It's so bad when you guys. I'm telling you, when you're in the middle of these halls and there's no windows, the the the, the displays are all huge. It, it's almost impossible to find your way out. It's kind of like they do with the casinos. Mm -hmm. It's like they don't want you. I don't know if they, they just don't want you to find your way out, but. It, it can be it can be very very much overwhelming. Good place to get lost in though, just guns everywhere. Oh yeah, oh yeah. What <laughs> All my favorite companies. <laughs> <laughs> now what uh, what state are you from now? Oregon. Oregon. Okay. So you're in a state that is attempting to join the West Coast Wall of Gun Control. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. I mean, Oregon is very liberal, but it hasn't gotten to the point to really it affects our day to day life yet. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, maybe in Portland, sure, but not where I live. Um, they're definitely trying to pass mm -hmm. all these gun control laws. It seems like every three or four months there's a new one, but um, not yet. But the day that they do, I mean, I'll probably have to consider leaving, but it's it's tough. Let me, okay, so from a military background, let me just, let me just, there's one bill, SB 501, which is, I mean, this is a really bad one. Oh, yeah. It's, this <laughs> is a measure where they want to limit magazine. First of all, they want to require you to get a gun permit before you can purchase a firearm. Uh, they want to require background checks for ammunition. They want to limit you to purchasing 20 rounds of ammunition in a month. And then they want to limit magazine capacity to uh, five to five rounds. And then they want to put in place extreme risk protection orders. Um, it would make us like worse than California if it got oh, passed overnight. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. Yeah. It basically puts California gun control, uh, gun control to shame. Now, my experience with Oregonians has been that they're, it's probably a more libertarian state. Absolutely. Or it's, historically, it's been, it's been generally more libertarian. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like, though, the infusion of Californians who, you know, whose liberal policies has, has, has chased them out, now they're starting to try and implement those policies in, in, in Oregon. Um, is that pretty much what you're seeing there? I'm not sure what it is because honestly, most of the Californians that come to Oregon leave California because they dislike how liberal it's become. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that's it or if it's just the younger generation or just the people in Portland kind of having their way with the rest of the state. Right. So I'm not, I'm not really sure I can say what it is, but um, 
it's definitely disheartening because, uh, like I said, I, I left California myself about 10 or 11 years ago to move to Oregon for those exact reasons. Mm -hmm. And if Oregon goes the same way as California, at least on the gun control issue, then I, yeah, I, I can't do that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, and I keep telling people it's reason why, you know, if you have the, the energy, if you have the resources where you, you need to fight, you need to fight where you are. Uh, and eventually, then we realize something. You know, you got to. Sometimes you just have to. That's just the way. That's just the way things are. Um, but uh, I always say I'm. I'm not a cut and run conservative. People keep telling me, Craig, just leave California. Leave California. I'm like, if someone broke into your home, would, if someone started implementing things, wouldn't you, would you just give it up? And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. But you know, I also know that eventually a time may come where I have to leave. And it's important that wherever you are, even if you are somewhere else, even if you're not in Oregon, recognize what's going on in Oregon, and if you can, help out. Help out the organizations that are having an impact on that policy in Oregon. Because here's the deal, folks. If they're not fighting it in Oregon, absolutely, if they're not fighting it in California or Washington, they're going to be fighting it in Arizona, they're going to be fighting it in Texas, they're going to be fighting it wherever you are. So don't think that you can run away from it. Well, that's the exact problem. I mean, it's it's spreading, and people in Oregon used to think the exact same thing. They're yeah. like, oh, look at California, like it's a dumpster fire, like it's never going to come here. I'm sure same thing with a lot of states on the East Coast, but it's spreading. I mean, Colorado even banning 10-round magazines. I'm sure people never would have never thought that was going to come. I mean, the fact that Beto O'Rourke almost won in Texas, people never would have thought he stood a chance in Texas of exact, all places. of all places. These, I mean, these ideas spread. And if you just let it happen, well, you it'll just, come just, to a state near you. I mean, I Arizona <laughs> probably rated the most pro-gun state in the country. I'm trying to remember. Did the did the liberal Democrat actually win that Senate seat? I don't. I don't know. I don't I remember, remember if they. I don't. I don't want to say that they did, but the fact that they were even close yeah. um, is scary. Absolutely. Because as soon as they get elected, the first thing they're going to want to do is they're going to start wanting to implement and put these policies. You have you have Florida, which was once known as you know the gunshine state. You've got two senators who are supporting uh, red flag laws, which are, you know, gun confiscation. Yeah, I'm outside. Program. Well, and bringing it back to Oregon real quick, though, a lot of people, a lot of people in Oregon, like you said, are very libertarian. And even a lot of the Democrats, they're either old school Democrats or they're libertarian Democrats where they're very pro-gun Democrats. Right. The problem is, though, is the people that they elect are not they're more of the mainstream Democrats or the new socialist type Democrats and they're the ones that are implementing all these policies so it's just a shame because you're having the most ex extreme part of the Democrat Party are the ones that are actually ended up getting elected and making laws because most of them really especially where I live are not that bad most Democrats are very conservative or libertarian and just seeing the way it's going is not not what most people want, even though they may vote for them, it's not necessarily what they want. I, it's funny you say that because I always say I grew up in Richmond, California, which is a very liberal area. But my parents, I always say I was raised by Democrats, but I was also raised conservative. Mm -hmm. My parents raised me to, to be conservative. And but yet the people that they elected to office were never consistent with those values. I changed parties because I, I needed I wanted to elect people who more closely represented what was important to me and my values. And I think that people in the, in, who believe that the Second Amendment is a fundamental right, is a, as a constitutionally enumerated right, need to make sure that if you're going to elect people, that they represent your values. Absolutely. All right. So uh, how can folks follow you or follow what's going on with uh, any other work that you're doing or anything like that? Oh, well, I'm just on Instagram and such as Alex Scarlatos. So just at Alex Scarlatos, A-L-E-K-S-K-A-R-L-A-T-O-S. Thank you, so, for, thank you yeah. for spelling. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, folks, hey, that's going to be it. Hey, we're going to be back later on with uh, a lot more cool interviews. So uh, you go, you guys stay tuned. Make sure you're sharing these videos so the folks can get an idea of what's going on here at SHOT Show 2019. We'll talk to you again real soon. If you like our videos, follow, subscribe, like, and share.